is the source and sustainer of all things. Who is the source and sustainer of everything that exists? A few years ago on our TV program, we did a series called What You Were Made For, How Knowing God Will Transform Your Life. And we went through some of the attributes of the source and sustainer of all things. We're not going to be able to cover them all here this morning. I just want to list them. We're going to look at a few of them. The first thing that we need to understand about the source and sustainer of all things is that this being is self-existing. He's the uncaused source of all being. He's eternal. He didn't have a beginning. He's uncaused and the foundation of everything that exists. And by the way, you can get to this being by philosophy. Aristotle knew there had to be an unmoved mover. There had to be a being whose essence equaled his existence, a being who gives being to everything else. The Bible calls this being the great I am. The being that had no beginning, the being that will have no end, the being that just bees. Where does the great I am come from? Nowhere. The great I am has always existed. Who refers to the great I am? It's mentioned in Exodus 3.14. The burning bush. Remember when God appeared to Charlton Heston? (laughs) Who should I tell the Israelites you are? Tell them I am sends you. This being is also infinite, unlimited, completely actualized. What do I mean by actualized? Aristotle and then Aquinas had this distinction between potential and actuality. We have potential, right? We can change, we can get better or worse, we can get bigger or smaller. But the being that created and sustains all things can't change. He's completely maxed out. He has no potential. He's an infinite being. He has no limits. This being is also simple. He's undivided in being. He's not made of parts. You realize that everything that we see here is made of parts? You're made of parts. This church is made of parts, as we see. We've got part rug, part no rug. Um, But there has to be a being who's not made of parts, who's not composed. Because if he was composed, he would need an uncomposed composer to compose him. There's got to be something that's uncomposed, that composes everything else. This being is also spaceless. He transcends space. He's timeless. He transcends time. Who made God? Nobody. He's timeless. If you're outside of time, do you have a beginning? No, he is the uncreated creator, the unmoved mover. He had no beginning. He is the I am. This being is also immaterial. In other words, he's spirit. He's not made of matter. He's omnipotent. He's all powerful. He's omnipresent, everywhere present. Now, what does that mean? When we say God is in you, if you're a Christian, does that mean if we were to cut you open, you find God in there? No, it means God is related to you and he sustains you, but he's not you. God holds this podium together as he holds you together. But he's not the podium and he's not you. He holds it together through his power, but he's not in this material. You understand? That would be pantheism, that God is all. God is me, God is you, God is the grass, God is the trees, God is this podium. That's pantheism, that's not theism, that's not Christianity. God created all this and sustains it, but he's not all this. He's present Everywhere in the universe, his power is present, but he's not the universe. This being is also omniscient. He's all-knowing. He's also immutable, meaning he's unchangeable. He can't change why he's the standard, the perfect standard by which everything else is measured. This being is also personal. He has mind, emotion, and will. He makes choices. When we say you're made in the image of God, what does that mean? It doesn't mean you look like God because God is immaterial. It means you're a person. And God is personal. You have mind, emotion, and will. You know, you feel, you want, you make choices. You can create like God. That's what it means to be made in the image of God. Unlike any other being, you have those capacities. Yes, other beings have capacities to do things like we do. But no other being 
ponders his or her existence or why he or she exists. There's no other being that thinks there's a being beyond them who created and sustains them. There's no Canaanite or there's no canine house of worship, right? There's no feline house of worship. We're the only beings that ponder our existence and ponder there's a reason for why we're here and realize that there's a being beyond us who created us and sustains us. This being is also triune, three persons in one divine essence. You don't get that from philosophy. The only way you can get that is through revelation, direct revelation from God through the scriptures. This being is also holy. In other words, this being is set apart, morally perfect, love and justice. And all these relate together. If this being is perfect, how could he change? He's already a perfect being. And he changed would necessitate a move from perfection to imperfection. So he is the unchangeable standard by which everything else is measured. Now, you can arrive at some of these attributes of God through evidence, through science, and evidence through philosophy. Some of it you can only get through the scriptures. So we're going to take a minute to look at all of that. First of all, let's look at the scriptures and what do the scriptures say about who is God and what is he like? There's one passage in the book of Isaiah. Have you guys ever had any teaching in the book of Isaiah? How far is the great Jack Hibbs in Isaiah right now? He's done? No, he'll never be done. I want to go to Isaiah chapter 40, because in Isaiah chapter 40, God is speaking, and here's what God says. To whom will you compare me, or who is my equal, says the Holy One. In other words, God is saying, you want to know what I'm like? Here's the answer. Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. The God with all those attributes we just mentioned said, if you want to know what I'm like, one thing you can do is look to the heavens because I created all of these, I named all these, and I sustain all these. So let's take a look at the heavens. If we look at the heavens, we can see that the heavens are precisely created and designed. We can also see that they're unimaginably vast and they're dazzlingly beautiful. And we're going to look at each one of these here this morning. First of all, let's take a look at the fact that the heavens are precisely created and designed. In fact, even atheists now are admitting that the universe You guys awake? (laughs) The universe had a beginning out of nothing. Even atheists like Stephen Hawking who just died recently said almost everyone now believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. Now I know, I know there's some people here who are saying, Frank, 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 you know we're Christians here. We don't believe in the Big Bang. You guys don't believe in the Big Bang? I believe in the Big Bang. I just know who banged it. In fact, the evidence is so good, even the atheists are admitting it. Now, Hawking tries to come up with another explanation other than God to explain how space, matter, and time could have a beginning out of nothing. He fails, but he's admitting the data. When an atheist admits to you that Genesis 1-1 appears to be true, you ought to go with it. And it's not just Hawking who said this. A Russian cosmologist by the name of Alexander Vilenkin put it this way after reviewing all of the data that he could uh, review regarding the beginning of the universe. Here's what he said. He said, with the proof now in place, cosmologists, and by the way, a cosmologist is not somebody that puts on your makeup, all right? (laughs) Cosmologist is somebody that studies the origin of the universe. Cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is now no escape They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. Now, about six years ago, 
Valenkin went to Hawking's 70th birthday party and he gave a paper. I guess that's what scientists do when they go to birthday parties. They give papers. What's your paper going to be on, Al? Anyway, his paper at Hawking's birthday party was a paper about how all the evidence that we know of to this point shows that the universe had a beginning. That space, matter, and time literally came into existence out of nothing. What's nothing? Aristotle had a good definition of nothing. He said, nothing is what rocks dream about. That's nothing. The entire space-time continuum came into existence out of nothing. Well, if that's the case, as the atheists are admitting, then whatever created space, matter, and time can't be made of space, matter, and time. In other words, the cause must transcend space, matter, and time. The cause must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful to create the universe out of nothing, personal in order to choose to create, because in order to create, you've got to make a choice, and only persons can make choices. Also, the being must be intelligent, because again, to make a choice, you've got to be intelligent. Now, when you think about a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent cause, who do you think of? That's what we mean by God. Now, how do we know it's the Christian God? We don't yet. We've got to look at more evidence for Jesus. But when we look at the evidence for Jesus and you realize he rose from the dead, then the same being that created The universe in Genesis 1-1 is the same being that walked out of the tomb 1,985 years ago. You know what else this means, ladies and gentlemen? That when Jesus met with the woman at the well near Mount Gerizim in central Israel, as recorded in John chapter 4, he said this to her. He said, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. God is immaterial. He's not made of molecules. This is what Jesus is saying. That's what the evidence shows. Now, you know, there's a lot of people out there who don't believe in miracles. They can't believe in Jonah. They can't believe in Noah. They can't believe in a resurrection. But what is the greatest miracle in the Bible? Greatest miracle in the Bible is the first verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If that verse is true, every other verse is at least possible, right? Well, you now have atheists admitting that the first verse appears to be true. They're at least admitting the data for it. Well, if Genesis 1-1 is true, if the greatest miracle has occurred, can God do whatever he wants? It's not logically impossible inside the universe. Can he raise Jesus from the dead if he can create the universe out of nothing? Of course he can. And he did. Now I mentioned not only that the universe is designed, or I should say created, it's also precisely designed. How many people have ever heard this name? Chuck Lorre. Anyone heard that name? Anyone know who he is? He's a TV producer. In fact, ironically, one of the shows he produces is called Big Bang Theory. And uh, what he does at the end of the program, after all of the credits have already been put up, he puts up some kind of saying or some kind of paragraph in the end of the credits. And there's no way you can read it unless you freeze the screen because it's only up there for about a second. And I happened to come across one of these that he put. uh, I actually found it on the Internet. Now, I don't know this man's religious beliefs, but here's what he wrote. In one of these sayings he put at the end of the Big Bang Theory program. Here's what he wrote. Check this out. In no particular order, I could not or would not exist without air, food, water, gravity, tides, the moon, the sun, the night, civilization, the laws of physics, the laws of thermodynamics, the law of the land, ancestors having sex, DNA, viruses, bacteria, plants, animals, oceans, ice caps, the kindness of strangers, the Big Bang, familiar bonds, smart people, brave people, memory, medicine, the periodic table of elements, tribal instincts, magnetic field, weather, earth, molten core, a rotating earth, a tilted earth, tectonic plate, sleep, death, heat, consciousness, evolution, teachers, and the miraculous self-regulating chemical factory that is my body. Other than that, I like to think of myself as a self-made man. (laughs) Well, exactly! 
Do you see how many things we're dependent on just to draw breath every day? Now, some of the things he mentions in this list are actually elements of what scientists have discovered in the past 50 or 60 years called the fine-tuning of the universe. That the universe is precisely tweaked to support life here on earth. That if you were to change any one of a number of factors about our universe, just virtually imperceptible change to any of these attributes or factors about our universe, there would be no universe and therefore there would certainly be no life. In fact, let's take a look at just a couple of these. And there are several of them. Let's just look at a couple. Stephen Hawking, again the atheist, put it this way about the expansion rate of the universe. He said, if the expansion rate of the universe was different by one part in a thousand million million, a second after the Big Bang, the universe would have collapsed back on itself or never developed galaxies. You change the expansion rate, that infinitesimal amount from the very beginning of the universe and nothing exists. Certainly no life exists. Now what does this say about macroevolution? Nothing. But I quite often hear atheists say, well if macroevolution is true, there's no need for God. That's nonsense. Why? What do you need before you can ever get to biology? You need a universe, right? The universe needs a creator and a designer from the very beginning. You can't make any evolutionary argument for this. Why? Because these are the initial conditions of the universe. The universe started this way and continues to expand at a rate that is fine-tuned. So it seems to me the same being that created space, matter, and time is the same being that fine-tuned the expansion rate to be exactly what it was and it is today. Also, the gravitational force, if it were altered by more than one part in 10 to the 40th power, we wouldn't be here. What's one part in 10 to the 40th power? That's one part in one with 40 zeros following it. You say, Frank, I can't get my head around that number. I know, neither can I. So let me give you an illustration. Take a tape measure and stretch it across the entire known universe. That's a long way. Set the gravitational force at a particular inch mark on that tape measure. I realize gravity is not measured in inches. This is just to give you a scale idea in your mind. If the strength of gravity was different by one inch in either direction across a scale as wide as the entire known universe, we wouldn't be here. That's how fine-tuned the gravitational force is. Now, I don't have enough faith to believe that that value just landed there by chance. And oh, by the way, when scientists use the word chance, is that really a cause? Is chance a cause? Does chance cause things? Who caused this? Chance, he was just here. No, no. Chance is a word we use to describe mathematical possibilities. Chance is nothing. It has no causal power of its own. So when scientists use the word chance, you know what they really mean? Uh, We don't know. I don't have enough faith to believe that that value is right where it is for us to be here, unless some intelligence put it there. You can even make an argument our solar system is designed with us in mind. Where are we in the solar system? Right there, third rock from the sun. Who said you don't learn from sitcoms? (laughs) If we were just a little bit closer to or a little bit further away from the sun, we couldn't survive. A little bit closer to, we'd burn up. A little bit further away, we'd freeze. We are what scientists call the Goldilocks zone. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. It is... That's a lie. It's too hot here in the summer. I've been here. The axial tilt, 23 and a half degrees, change that slightly, we don't exist. Earth rotation, 24 hours, change that slightly, we don't exist. The size and distance of the moon from us, change that slightly, we don't exist. Oxygen in this room right now is 21%. If it were 15%, we'd all suffocate. If it were 25%, spontaneous fires would break out. If Jupiter was not in its current orbit right here, we couldn't exist. Why? What does Jupiter do for us? Jupiter acts as a cosmic vacuum cleaner. Its gravitational force is so strong that it attracts most of the meteors and space junk to it rather than us. In fact, if you take a close-up look at Jupiter, you know what these purple marks are right here? 
Those purple marks are comet fragment strikes that are bigger than the Earth. Thank God for Jupiter. Because if Jupiter wasn't there, we wouldn't be here. In fact, a number of years ago, I was just surfing through the Internet, and I wound up on the Drudge Report. By the way, whenever I want to be convinced the universe is going to end this week, I always go to the Drudge Report. It's like, what is going on here? This, this is crazy. Anyway, this headline of the Drudge Report said this. Scientists believe major meteor to hit Earth in 2040. I am rooting for Jupiter. <laughs> Jupiter can save us! Now, not only are the heavens precisely created and designed, they are unimaginably vast! In fact, I just noticed this poor woman has to be working overtime because I speak at 350 words a minute with Gus to 500. <laughs> Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. <laughs> Doesn't want to play. Doesn't want to play. All right. All right, let's take a look at the planets again. Take a look at this. There's Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Earth, Pluto. Look at poor Pluto down here. You know, Pluto recently has been demoted as a planet. I don't know about you, but I think it's size discrimination. <laughs> Take a look at this. Oh, you can hardly see Pluto. <laughs> Take a look at this. That's Arcturus. That's another star in our galaxy. Here's the sun over here. Jupiter is one pixel on size on this, in, in size on this scale. Earth is invisible. Pluto? Forget about it. <laughs> All right, keep an eye on Arcturus. You got Arcturus? All right. Where's Arcturus now? Left of the white star Regal. See it right there? That's Antares. That's another star in our galaxy. It's not outside our galaxy, inside our galaxy. The sun is one pixel in size on this scale. Jupiter is invisible. Earth, Pluto, forget about them. In fact, if the Earth was the size of a golf ball, Beetlejuice here... Look, I don't name the stars, okay? If the Earth was the size of a golf ball, Beetlejuice here would be five or six Empire State Buildings high. The heavens are awesome. This is inside our galaxy. This is not outside our galaxy. In fact, the average distance between stars in our galaxy is 30 trillion miles. All that distance is necessary for, for us to exist here on Earth, given the present laws of physics. Now, 30 trillion miles, how far is that? Far. far. Are you a math major, sir? 30 trillion miles. It'll take you at least two tanks of gas and a Toyota Prius <laughs> to go 30 trillion miles. That is if the gas pedal doesn't stick. A number of years ago, I was at the uh, Desert Museum in Tucson, Arizona. If you ever get to uh, go down to Tucson, they have a museum a little bit outside the city. And if you go there at night, on a clear night, they'll take you outside because it's so clear that you can see thousands of stars in the sky out there in the desert. So we're out there. This is about 20 years ago. We're out there one night, and the guide says, wow, it's so clear tonight that if we look up at 9.03, we'll see the space shuttle in orbit. I said, oh, come on. We're not going to see the space shuttle. It's only 120 feet long. It's 350 miles up. We're not going to see it. Oh, me of little faith. <laughs> At 9.03, the guide goes, look! And we look up in the sky about 70 degrees above the horizon. There's an object streaking out of the western desert sky relative to us about like this. When it got right about here, it disappeared. I don't know whether Scotty beamed it up or what. <laughs> Actually, what happened was, despite the fact that we were in total darkness, the space shuttle was so high up that the sun was still reflecting off of it. And when we got out of the range of the sun, we couldn't see it anymore. 
Now, when the space shuttle was in orbit, the space shuttle was traveling at about 18,000 miles an hour. Goes around the earth once every hour and 15 minutes. 18,000 miles an hour is about five miles per second. You got trouble getting to work in the morning? Take the space shuttle. (laughs) You'll be five miles a second. Think about how fast that is. Well, I did a little calculation to try and figure out how long would it take us if we could get in the space shuttle and go from our star, the sun, to another star in our galaxy, an average distance away, 30 trillion miles. In other words, how long would it take us to go 30 trillion miles if we could go five miles per second? How long do you think it would take us? A long time. Another math major. Thank you very much. (laughs) It would take us... 201,450 years. That means if you got in the space shuttle at the time of Christ and started traveling from our star, the sun, to another star in our galaxy an average distance away, you've been going five miles a second for 2,000 years, you'd be less than one hundredth of the way there right now. And we're going to explore space. No, we're not. (laughs) Come on. We're not going anywhere in space. We can hardly get out of our solar system. It took us nine years to get to Pluto. We're not going anywhere. Who'd like to go to the next nearest star? We'll go. Get in, kids. Are we almost there yet, Dad? Another 200,000 years. Play some more Xbox. Forget it. It's incredible. In fact, at light speed, the next nearest star is over three years away. What's light speed? 186,000 miles per second. The heavens are awesome. And that's just inside our galaxy. What about outside our galaxy? Astronomers have done some amazing things with the Hubble Space Telescope. One thing, uh, one, things, uh, one of the things they've done recently is they photographed one very small part of the sky, actually one 24 millionth piece of the sky. And they called this Hubble Ultra Deep Field. What's one twenty-four millionth of a sky? Take a piece of rice, put it on your finger, hold it up to the sky. That piece of rice demonstrates about one twenty-four millionth of the sky. And what they did is they photographed that over several revolutions of the Hubble Space Telescope. And I'm going to show you what they found. Now, here's a still from the beginning of this video I'm about to show you. You can see there are mountains right here. I don't know if you can see that. Okay. And uh, this is a photograph of the southern uh, piece of the sky in the southern hemisphere. When this video starts, you're going to see the constellations come up. And then the camera's going to zoom in on Hubble Ultra Deep Field, one twenty-four millionth of the sky. There's no audio, just video. You guys ready? Here we go. What you're looking at is nearly 10,000 galaxies. How many stars are out there? 
the number of stars that are out there are about equivalent to the number of grains of sand on all the beaches on all the earth. And to go from one star to another star in our galaxy, going five miles a second, will take you over 200,000 years. Do you see why God says, you want to know what I'm like? Look to the heavens. February 1st, 2003, President George W. Bush went into the East Room of the White House. It was Saturday afternoon. They turned the TV cameras on. Every major network carried his address. Saturday afternoon? Why? The president looked in the camera and said, My fellow Americans, this morning our country experienced a great tragedy. Upon re-entry into the atmosphere, the space shuttle Columbia burned up in the skies over Texas. There are no survivors. The Columbia is lost. The president then went on to quote from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 25, which is our text for today. We read it earlier. To whom will you compare me or who is my equal, says the Holy One. In other words, God's saying, you want to know what I'm like? Here's the comparison. Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these stars and named them one by one because of his great power and mighty strength? Not one of them is missing. The president then looked back in the camera and said, The same God that created and named all those stars is the same God that created and knows the names of the seven astronauts who perish today. While they did not return safely home to us, we can all now pray they've all returned safely home. You want to know what God's like? Most of us think God is a big angel. No, God is not a big angel. You want to know what God is like? Look to the heavens. In fact, look at the attributes we mentioned earlier. He's spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, moral, personal, intelligent, loving, just. Look at all those attributes. Meditate on those attributes. Then remove all limits from your mind. That's God. Now, the being that created and sustains everything that exists who has unimaginable power, unimaginable insight. If this being really exists, and he does, do you think that he might have a reason for something going on in your life right now that you can't quite figure out? Do you think he might be doing something? You don't know what that thing is? In fact, you're upset because things aren't going the way you want them to. Do you think might, he might have a reason for what he's been doing in your life? A God that amazing? A God without limits who knows the end from the beginning? This is why God said to Job, you just need to trust me. Because there's no way you could even comprehend the universe you couldn't comprehend how all things work together. Even if I were to try to explain it to you, you wouldn't be able to comprehend it. By the way, why is there a second commandment? Thou shalt make no graven image. One reason there's a second commandment is because any image you make of an infinite being necessarily limits his majesty. You can't draw a picture of an infinite being. An infinite being has no limits. Oh, you can draw a picture of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus had two natures. He had a divine nature and a human nature. You can, you can draw the human nature. You can't draw the divine nature. It's unlimited. That's why the scriptures say, the heavens declare the glory of God. Look to the heavens. Why? Because when we look to the heavens, we not only see an unimaginable 
unimaginably vast expanse, we see beauty as well. In fact, that's our next point. That the heavens are also dazzlingly beautiful. And all I'm going to do here is just show you pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope. Here's the Sombrero Galaxy. The eyes of the Lord go to and fro. When you look at these images, do you conclude that we are insignificant? The writer of Psalm 8 asked that question. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? Ladies and gentlemen, as amazing as the heavens are, you're far more amazing. Why? Because the heavens are not made the image of God, but you are. In fact... The stars are not made in his image, but you are. In fact, let's go back to the attributes that we listed in the beginning. By the way, this DVD set was on the book table, but we sold out of it in the first service. If you want a copy of it, you can sign up and we'll send it to the church for next week and you can pick it up. Just go to the book table back there. You can go online and download it immediately if you want. But we go through all of these attributes of God. But look at the last one. Holy, set apart, morally perfect, justice and love. God just didn't just create a universe and then leave it. God created a universe, he sustains it, and he created you, and he loves you. In fact, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining All things by his powerful word. So not only do the heavens declare the glory of God, the sun declares the glory of God. And as amazing as the heavens are, you're amazing as well. In fact, to illustrate this, let's go all the way back to the beginning. Not the beginning of the universe, but the beginning of you. Let's go back to the beginning when your mother and your father got together to conceive you. Have you guys had this talk before? I see some young people in here, so I'll try and be discreet. I also see some older people in here, so I'll try and be discreet as well, just in case you've forgotten how this works. When your mother and your father got together to conceive you, your mother unconsciously perfumed her egg to attract your father. And then your father sent the entire population of the United States. 300 million soldiers toward your mother's egg. And then there was a race. And you won. Don't let anyone ever tell you you're not special. You beat out 300 million others. You have blown away anything Michael Phelps has done. (laughs) Now, seeing some of you limp in here earlier makes it hard for me to believe you were the fastest soldier in the gene pool. (laughs) But you were. Now, your soldier was 20 to 30 times smaller than a grain of salt. Yet it contained half of the genome, the 3.5 billion letter genome, all the letters in the right order, that make you you. That genome is the longest word we've ever discovered and it's inside every one of your 40 trillion cells. And your mother's egg 
which was about the size of a period at the end of a sentence in an average book, contained the other half of the 3.5 billion letter genetic genome or genetic code that makes you you. And when your soldier and your egg came together, a new 100% genetic human being was created. Do you realize you have not received any more genetic information from this point till right now? In fact, there were only four things separating you from adulthood. Time, air, water, and food. Those are the same four things that separate a two-year-old from adulthood. Does this have implications on the abortion issue? Yeah, I think it does. We don't kill the two-year-old. Why do we kill the unborn child in the womb? Genetically, it's the same. You say, Frank, time out. You can't legislate morality. All right, no extra charge for this, friends. No extra charge. All laws legislate morality. The guy that Jack just had up there from Torrance who said that you're going to have to evolve in your beliefs because we're imposing our beliefs on you, he's imposing a moral point of view too, isn't he? See, all laws legislate morality. Every law says one behavior is right and the opposite behavior wrong. Uh, the opposite, opposite behavior is wrong. You can't think of a law which doesn't legislate a moral position. The only question is, whose morality will we legislate? And when people come up to me and they say, hey, don't impose your morality on me, I go, why not? Would that be immoral? <laughs> Do you realize you're imposing your morality on me right now? That's a moral position. You ought not impose ought nots, but you're imposing one. But actually, the better answer is this. This isn't my morality. I didn't make this stuff up. I didn't make up the fact that murder is wrong, that theft is wrong, that rape is wrong, that abortion is wrong, that men were made for women and women were made for men. And the best way to perpetuate and stabilize society is to legally recognize that marriage relationship over any other relationship. I didn't make any of this stuff up. This isn't my morality. This is the morality. The one Thomas Jefferson said was self-evident. The one the Apostle Paul said, even the Gentiles are not of the law of the law written on their hearts. This isn't my morality. This isn't your morality. This is the morality. So if you've got a problem with the morality, you don't have a problem with me. You've got a problem with the creator who set it up this way. By the way, that's why one reason I love Pastor Jack, because I've never been to a church where a pastor would stand up here and inform you as to what's going on in society particularly on issues that can impact the church and impact the lives of people. I've never seen that. We need more churches like this church. All right, no extra charge for that. Let's go back to this. From this point till right now, a construction project of astonishing complexity began taking place. Cells began multiplying at a rate of 4,000 cells per second. Brain cells began multiplying at a rate of 100,000 cells per second. For most of you, anyway. <laughs> Some cells became brain cells, others lung cells, others heart cells. How did they know how, they know how to do this? Nobody knows. Some cells went so far across you to become what they needed to become that it would be equivalent to you today walking across the United States alone. And that construction project continues to this day. You just made 4 million new red blood cells. You just made another 4 million new red blood cells. You just made another 4 million new red blood cells. Knock it off! Are you thinking about this? Are you sitting there going, time out, Frank, hold on, got to concentrate. New red blood cells, coming up. Now, how is all this happening? Because God is sustaining all things by his powerful word. You're not even thinking about this and it's happening. In fact, let's just take a real simple example about how God is directing everything. Why does an egg corn always become an oak tree? Why doesn't it become an elm tree or a birch tree or a seahorse? <laughs> because it's programmed to become an oak tree. Well, who programmed it? And by the way, is an acorn conscious? Is an acorn sitting in the ground going, all right, what do I need to do to become an oak tree? No, but if it's properly nourished, it reliably becomes an oak tree. In other words, it goes in a direction. Aristotle rec recognized this 2,400 years ago. Aquinas baptized it in the 1200s and said, this is going to be my fifth way to argue for God. What way? 
notice that things that don't even have a mind go in a direction. Well, if they don't have a mind of their own, yet they're going in a direction, there must be an external mind directing them. That external mind is what we mean by God. That's why Aquinas came along and he said, this is going to be my fifth way to argue for God. That everything's going in a direction. You couldn't even do science unless everything was going in a direction. That's why science needs God. So God not only creates this unbelievably precisely designed universe, which is unimaginably vast and beautiful, He's also designed you and He's directing you and me and this entire universe right now. Paul says, in Him we live and move and have our being. And that God sustains all things by His powerful Word. So there's a power out there that started the universe and sustains it. And He created us and He sustains us. But He didn't leave us alone. He came to rescue us. September 29th, 2006. Petty Officer Michael Monsor is a United States Navy SEAL. He's standing on a roof in Ramadi, Iraq. He's got two other Navy SEALs on the roof with him, one on each side. Monsor is in front of a doorway to that roof. He and his colleagues are engaging terrorists. At some point, a terrorist throws a grenade up on the roof. It hits Monsor in the chest and falls to his feet. He's got a split second to make a decision. He can leap through the doorway behind him and save himself. But if he does that, his Navy SEAL colleagues are surely going to die. So Monsor yells, Grenade! And then he jumps chest first onto the grenade. It detonates. 30 minutes later, he dies. His colleagues are not hurt. At the funeral, one of the survivors said, Mikey looked death in the face that day and said, you will not take my friends, I will go in their stead. There's no greater love, Jesus said, than to die for your friends. Mansoor died for his friends. He sacrificed himself to save them. Has anybody sacrificed himself to save you? Yeah, somebody actually did. It's an historical fact. At Monsor's funeral, which was held here on the West Coast, just about every Navy SEAL on the West Coast showed up. You know, the SEALs trained down in Coronado, not too far from here. And as you know, in the Navy, I was in naval aviation, so we earned wings. But Navy SEALs earn golden tridents. Tridents are the most difficult insignia in any military to earn. Very few people who start Navy SEAL training actually complete it. But those that do complete it earn the golden trident, which they wear proudly. That trident is their identity. At Monsor's funeral, the Navy SEALs who showed up took off their tridents and pressed them into his coffin. They took their identity and put it in their Savior. That's what we're supposed to do. You know, our culture tells us that we need to put our identity in everything other than God. We're to put our identity in our race or our gender or our sexual preference or our political party or our job or our vocation or our bank account or our family, which is a good thing, but it's not the ultimate thing. We're supposed to put our identity in our Savior. Have you done that? 
What is the most important thing about you? When you hear the word God, who do you think about? Do you think about a being beyond comprehension that created and sustained not only this beautiful, vast universe, but you as well? Who literally added flesh to his deity and came to earth to allow the creatures who rebelled against him to torture and kill him so he wouldn't have to punish them? There's no greater love than that. Have you accepted that love? That's the most important thing about you. By the way, he proved it by walking out of the grave 1,985 years ago. Do you see why this is called the greatest story ever told? Because the creator and sustainer of this vast, beautiful universe actually entered it to save us. Have you ever accepted that?